The idea today is to talk about feed efficiency in small ruminants, basically sheep. Uh, in terms of concept traits, uh, how to record those traits, how to calculate feed efficiency, and what happens if we want to, uh, to select uh, for feed efficiency and what happened with the system. The presentation is prepared with uh, my colleagues, uh, Ignacio de Barbieri and Gabriel Chapesoni from INIA2 from Uruguay. This is basically the content of the presentation. Just going to check the time. I know that I have time, but uh, just in case, when I work. So one of the first things, although it's clearly uh, efficiency is one of the topics within the SMARTER project. Uh, one thing is efficiency in terms of efficiency of the systems or efficiency of the animal. And a specific trait is feed efficiency. It's part of the efficiency of the production, efficiency of the system, but feed efficiency is specifically one trait. And it's defined as the ability of livestock to transform feed, feed into food edible by humans. So it's clear that feed intake by the animal is related with the production. And here I added some uh, Oswald. I uh, added some uh, examples in terms of meat, uh, product for milk, uh, for sheep or goat milk. But also, and I added because it's also important for, for Uruguay, is wool production. Uh, fibers and natural fibers are getting even more important nowadays in terms of uh, sustainability of the production of clothes and all the Hindu industry around. And wool is definitely a natural fiber and it can be produced in an organic way. So why is so important? We know that a large proportion of the production cost is explained by a feed cost. So it's directly related, not only by the price of the feed, but also by the level of feed. So reducing the feed intake of the animals, we're going to have a huge impact in profit because, as you may not read because it's too small, the here it says between 60 and 70 percent of the total cost are, uh, is based on feed cost. It's explained by feed cost. But we know at the same time that feed intake is correlated with the level of production. So it's not just reducing feed intake, because if we reduce feed intake, we're going to reduce production, and uh, we're going to have to reduce the input, the economic input from the system. So what we are talking here, and is actually what the economic relevance is focused now, is in terms of lowering feed intake without compromising the level of production of the animals or the system. And that is feed efficiency, and that, and that is improving feed efficiency. It's economically relevant, but it's the importance of feed efficiency go beyond economics. And it's talking about other aspects of sustainability. Improving feed efficiency means that it makes a contribution to providing the food and fibers of this global population that is rising, but what? But optimizing the use of the resources. Basically, here we have been uh, thinking about the use of, of land because it gives room for doing two important things. One is the responsible use of the resources and uses land for more than one production and combining production in a sustainable way. That means uh, other source of feed for human and also uh, forestry. And also the fact of giving room for conservation, particularly of biodiversity of uh, natural uh, grassland areas. And also, working on feed efficiency has a positive impact on greenhouse gas emissions. And here we are talking not just about uh, adaptation, but also about mitigation of climate change. Because feed intake is not only related, directly related with production, but it's also directly uh, related with uh, methane emissions uh, by the animals. 
there's a huge numbers of way of definitions in terms of feed efficiency, uh, in terms of intake, also in terms of energy for growing animals and for uh, lactating uh, or mature animals. This is a table from a, a paper presented in the World Congress by Berry and Price. You can see another, uh, there's a, also another review by uh, Berry and Crowley of 2013, uh, more focus on, on growing animals. And those, all those are definitions of way or different ways to calculate feed efficiency. The first part of the, the, bottom, uh, the top of the table, what we have are what we call ratio traits, and in the bottom, the residual traits. Today, I'm going to focus in two of all this group of, of, of definitions. One is the feed conversion ratio. That is the opposite of you know, the inverse of this one. And residual feed intake that is, has, or has become one of the most uh, commonly used uh, measurements of feed efficiency. And I'm going to focus on growing animals rather than on lactating animals today. The feed conversion ratio is uh, defined as the dry matter intake or the feed intake per unit of gain of weight. One thing, important thing that you have to notice is that uh, feed intake is measured fresh, but to standardize the measurements, you convert the fresh, the kilogram of fresh food that an animal eats by the percentage of dry matter intake and you transform that in dry matter, a uh, percentage of dry matter of the, of, the, of the feed, and you transform that in dry matter intake. Lower feed conversion ratios mean high feed efficiency. And it's one of the, it's not just easy to calculate, but it's also the, uh, the measurement that is uh, commonly used. Uh, and it's usually the common language across all the stakeholders in the industries, in the meat industries, uh, is the, the normal number that nutritionists use, farmer use, and other uh, uh, participants of the industry can understand very quickly. Even for comparing different species, is also the, the, the parameter that is being used. But it has limitations, particularly for the animal breeding point of view. One is a ratio trait, and I don't know uh, if you know, but usually uh, <coughs> breeders don't like ratio traits to be included for the estimation of breeding values. And it has another consequence that is basically correlated with growth, and the variation is basically explained by growth. And that have implications on the fact that selecting for low feed conversion ratio tend to increase the mature weight in the uh, as genetic response. And that has two consequences. One is that you are, if you select for uh, feed conversion ratio, you increase the mature weight. The mature weight are connected with two consequences. One is higher carcass weight. That is something that sometimes you don't want within your system. And the others and the other and is the and, and has a heavy consequence within the system is that you are, uh, as correlate response, you have uh, bigger uh, breeding females, cows or sheep, and that increase the maintaining cost of the breeding side of the production system. That is something that you, uh, in general, we don't want. We don't we want to increase the carcass, side, many, uh, carcass weight of the animal many times by trying to keep uh, uh, constant the size or, and the maintaining cost of the uh, breeding side of the system. The second measurement is residual feed intake. And as many of the definitions that you saw in that table with lots of equations, uh, they have been defined long time ago. Residual feed intake was defined by Koch in 1963, and is the difference between the actual feed intake, or the real feed intake that you measure in the animal, and the feed intake that is estimated based on the energy demands. demand. 
that is uh, easily the way the, of the definition. And how we, in the real world, in the growing animals, we estimate the dry matter intake is based on metabolic body weight, growth, and body composition, mainly. Actually, the, the original equation of Koch, because was before the ultrasound for me, uh, measuring carcass body, uh, body weight was, uh, body composition was created, the equation only includes metabolic body weight and average <coughs> daily gain. And this is the definition. Here we have the calculation. It's based on a linear regression model where you include dry matter intake, is the, the trait that the actual dry matter intake. This is, represents all the terms that are linked with the energy sinks or energy demands. And E, the residual of the model, is residual feed intake. How you interpret the results? <clears throat> this is real data in Merino, Merino lambs. And what we have here is the observed intake in kilograms of dry matter intake per, uh, per day, the predicted feed intake, that also dry matter intake. Each point or circle represents an animal. What we have here in this regression, this line that go here, is the, when the actual dry matter intake is equal to the estimated dry matter intake. All the animals that are below this, the regression line, that's one, uh, are deficient animals, those where the actual dry matter intake is uh, lower than the estimated dry matter intake. So what we have there are residual feed intake values that are negative, usually. And uh, that's one of the things that is complicated when you try to uh, use or translate this into the industry the interpretation of these values. And that's it's one of the limitations in the case of residual feed intake that feed conversion ratio doesn't have. And these are efficient, and those that are above the line are the inefficient animals. So they add more that they are really their production, that the value that you estimated based on their productions. In any case, for having a measurement of feed efficiency, we need the big, big challenge is to uh, measure the feed intake, particularly to measure individual feed intake. That is also the data that we need for animal breeding. For animal breeding, we don't work with group of animals or average of group of animals. We need the individual information. So, <clears throat> this is the big challenge. Nowadays, what we have is new technology that allows us to measure dry matter intake in the animals, but in confined conditions. There's no, at least so far, and as far as I know, uh, techniques to measure, to have accurate measurements of individual feed intake in pasture conditions. That is a huge uh, limitation because most of the systems, the livestock production systems, although they have sometimes finishing systems or in, in confined uh, con, uh, conditions in feedlots, most of the production uh, is carried out in grazing conditions. And the other thing in terms of feed efficiency is that it's not a one day phenotype. It's not that I go to the field, I do a measurement and that's it of feed intake. We need to run what we call feed efficiency test. The estimation of feed efficiency requires measuring feed intake and growth through a certain period of time. And because of that, when you're trying to do tests or several tests during the year or uh, and several years, like for example, building databases for a genetic evaluation or for more complex study that you need to collect more data, you need to be very clear in terms of how to standardize the information 
to be able to pull that data together and uh, to have the, the same analysis. Some of the key traits that are being standardized is because they have an effect on the trait, on feed the fish, on, on feed intake and also on growth, is the age as the, at the start of the, of the test, sex. One thing that is very, very important is diet composition and quality. It's important to try to keep constant the components that you use in the diet and the, uh, and the chemical composition of the diet or chemical quality of the diet and also the testing procedures, how you collect the data and how you edit the data that you're going to analyze. That's why since the beginning, and I, you, I, I've been working first on feed efficiency in, in cattle before I started working on feed efficiency in, in sheep. So there's lots of things that you're going to see uh, and that is going to be mentioned, uh, mentioned here that is related also with beef cattle. And the first is this. Because of the relevance of these, uh, of these uh, protocols that you have to define, there have been organized internationally protocols to define exactly those factors to be able to include information within uh, genetic evaluations. One is in ICAR, Australia, that was the first country that started measuring residual feed intake in cattle like in the 90s have another protocol, the Beef Improvement Federation uh, in America and, and that regulates other international genetic evaluations also have, uh, has protocols for feed efficiency. And uh, a smarter project and uh, grass to grass is working with ICAR on guidelines for the feed efficiency test in sheep. I mentioned you need to run feed efficiency test. The feed efficiency test has at least two stages. The first one that is also very important is the adaptation period that usually is like uh, at least minimum <coughs> is two weeks, 14 days. That is for the acclimatization of the animals to the facilities and also to the diet that is going to be used during the test. The second uh, phase is the evaluation period itself that usually goes between 35 to f f uh, 65 days, depending on the protocol that is being used by different organizations and different experiments. In Uruguay, for example, we use 42 days. The duration of the feed efficiency test is something that has been studied a lot because shorter tests implies more tests per, per year and lower cost per animal that is going to be evaluated. That is important, maybe not, <laughs> not that important uh, in terms of a, a specific experiment, but it's important when you're trying to build uh, recording systems for uh, genetic evaluations, especially when the, the private sector, the breeders or the students are going to be for pay for that. So you want uh, accurate measurements, but as cheap as possible to be uh, more inclusive. But the main limitation for uh, shorter tests is the fact that you ha don't have accurate measurements of growth. It's easy or easier to have uh, adaptation, faster adaptations for diets. So you can see that the curve of the intake of the animals is stabilized uh, quite fast, but you need more time to uh, that feed intake be expressed in different growth rates. And there have been many tests. Uh, one that is the one that uh, uh, died by Fernando Amarillo in, with Uruguay, but there are many traditional ones done. Um, not, I think that is, well, there are different in terms of uh, dairy cattle, beef cattle, and others in sheep too. So during, those, uh, during, during the evaluation uh, period, what you do is you have to monitor the daily intake and record the daily intake of in each animal. And the second group of traits is body weight. And there are different combinations and different possibilities, basically or depending on the facilities that you have or the objective 
of the of the work. Sometimes uh, bodies uh, body weight is just recorded at the beginning of the 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 trial and at the end. Sometimes it's recorded weekly, or sometimes it's recorded all the time, like uh, using uh, automatic weight. Uh, using uh, waiting platforms. And I, I, I'm going to show you this. The problem here is that weekly would be a very accurate information in terms of uh, particularly to have an accurate estimate of the growth rate in each animal. The problem here is that you are moving the animals and uh, moving, uh, affecting the behavior, the feeding behavior of the animal each time that you have to move the animals to be weighed. So this is an al another alternative in terms that is just automatic and every day without inter human intervention. Just, uh, this is uh, some pictures of what we have in, in, in Uruguay. Just to explain a little bit more how this system, there are different equipments in terms for feeding, uh, for feed uh, recording, but the basic is more or less the same and implies in some way the system, like here, they have a bin where the animal is fed, a system that is measuring all the time the feed that is within the bin, and in some way, different depends on the system, something that is reading the electronic identification of the animal. So the system, what does is, uh, assign the difference of weight of food of feed here in the bin to the identification that has been with the head inside the bin. And that is all the time. So at the end of the day, you're going to have a record of feeding take of each of the animals that, that were read uh, the, the electronic identification. And this is something that, you know, this is a, a, a Intergado, it's a Brazilian system that works for, uh, that's available for sheep and, and for beef. And, but basically, all the different equipments commercially available nowadays works based on the same, on the same principles. This is a waiting uh, platform that is linked with the water. So every time that the animals go to drink water, the weight is recorded. And based on that is that we, uh, <coughs> We have the, the weight of the animal and the evolution, the growth rate of each of the animals. This is a sort of protocol. It's an example of a protocol where you have the adaptation period when everything is, you know, you have to uh, be sure that they, all, the, uh, all the animals have electronic tag. The all electronic tags are actually working. That's something else. Uh, all the vet treatment have to be uh, in place before the beginning of the, of the test to be sure that they are in the best health conditions at the beginning of the test. If you have any problem and you have to have an intervention here, it's going to affect your measurement. And, and of course, is the adaptation to, to food. And this is basically how it works. And it's what I was mentioning, the animals uh, identification is read, the information in the food is also recorded, and the same happens with the, not with the water that the animal is drinking, but the weight that the animal, uh, that is being recorded when the animal uh, goes to drink water. Other important conditions for running feed efficiency test is this one, ad libitum feed, feeding, <coughs> to be sure that the animal can, each animal can ex express the maximum potential in terms of growth for the feed that is given. And of course, there cannot be a, a restriction in terms of access to water. And also, it's a, a, a condition for the in well-being of the animals. And then, depending on how the facilities and the equipment, you have to have in mind that how many animals you can use for each bin that you have, and the size of the pens where you put the animals. Why? Because you need to be sure that all animals have the same opportunity to access the food. 
So you have to facilitate the access and limit the competition among animals. It's many times it's very difficult to, and you have to watch, sometimes you have to remove animals from the pens because they, they, they have a bullying attitude that it cannot be uh, solved. And, 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 and it's true, they, sometimes you have to remove the animals. But basically, if you select the animals or put the animals and balance the animals in terms of the number of animals and the access uh, for each bin, and the size and the, the size in terms of the weight of the animals and the and the sex of the animals you can uh, balance the the behavior in terms of uh, avoiding or limiting any competition among animals so basically with this short diagram of uh, what a feed intake test is uh, from this daily monitoring you're going to have the intake per animal per day that you have to multiply for, dry matter, uh, for the percentage of dry matter to have the dry matter intake. And here, usually, this is uh, the regression, simple regression for uh, the average daily gain. Sometimes, uh, and we use sometimes quality controls, uh, for example, the R square for the calculation of the average daily gain should be uh, 0.95 or higher uh, to be sure that you can, that the actual estimate accumulation of information is accurate and it gives you a good estimate of the average daily gain. And the body weight is, uh, the metabolic body weight usually is the weight in the middle of the test multiply uh, uh, times uh, 0.75. I mentioned that, and I focus here in two traits, average daily gain and, and, and metabolic body weight. And usually, the other traits that are in growing animals included in the estimation of residual feed intake is body composition. For that, uh, Sometimes people have CT scanning measurements, but with the ones that we are not lucky, we have ultrasound measurements. Uh, I was looking to uh, the people from Scotland that have a uh, fantastic equipment for, for CT scanning. But uh, with, uh, uh, with ultrasound, you can measure the subcutaneous fat depths and the eye mass area or rib mass area. That's another way to call it. As indicator of fatness in the animal, or muscle uh, or, or lean content in the animal. Usually, they are measured at the end of the test of the uh, the test, and in could improve the estimation of residual feed intake. Sometimes they are not really very significant within the equation, but the prediction of residual feed intake can improve anyway. And something that has been seen and proposed. Uh, for example, for beef, beef cattle, is the use of inter, uh, intramuscular fat, no, uh, subcutaneous fat by ultrasound in the equation because it has an effect on, a, it has a positive or favorable effect on the estimation of the correlations of residual feed intake on other traits, and, and I'm going to mention that later. Genetics of residual feed intake. Uh, there's huge number of work done in, in, in cattle in terms of the, in cattle, in beef cattle and in dairy cattle in terms of estimation of genetic uh, parameters. Heritability is not the limiting factor for if you want to uh, improve uh, residual feed intake by selection. Actually, both residual feed intake and, and, and feed conversion ratio, both have a moderate uh, uh, heritabilities, more or less the magnitude of any other traits that you see in, in animal breeding. And I put together some results here from Flavi, from Uruguay, and from Johnson, is Trisha Johnson from, from New Zealand. Um, 
And basically, the estimations also include in previous estimations the, uh, the ability for feed intake, residual feed intake is moderate in both species, in both in sheep and in beef cattle. Uh, I'm talking here in terms of a uh, residual feed intake estimated in or measured in growing animals. And here is something interesting. The association of residual feed intake, I, I thought that it was, this was first than the other one, that was the association with other traits. What was the point? We say we want what is the best way to improve feed efficiency is reducing feed intake but without compromising the performance of the animals. Phenotypically, that is true. If residual feed intake is well estimated, it must be independent of the traits that is, are included in the, in the, in the linear regression. It's, it's, it's not a, it's just a, a statistics in terms of, the, of the, the attributes of a residual in the model. No, it's not, nothing special, more than that. What has been questioned all the time is, well, okay, residual feed intake is going to be independent of uh, growth, is going to be independent of metabolic weight at phenotypic level. Is that true at genetic level? Basically, most of the estimations shows that it's independent too. What we have here, and I have some animations. Well, first is that the limitation in terms of feed conversion ratio that we were mentioning is that is correlated with growth and is correlated with mature weight seems to be true. While feed efficiency, uh, residual feed efficiency is strongly correlated with dry matter intake, what means that, remember that efficient animals are the negative, no? So if we want to improve feed efficiency, feed efficiency, high feed efficiency is associated with lower dry matter intake. That is why, what we were waiting for. And at the same time, the correlations also phenotypically and genetically are close to zero. In sheep, these are results from sheep and these are from a meta-analysis in cattle. This confirms that low residual feed intake, the more efficient animals, is associated with lower dry matter intake without compromising uh, production. And something similar, because it's so, uh, it's so difficult to record the data for uh, in residual feed intake tests that before you can get or build the databases for the estimation of genetic parameters, but especially for, uh, you, know, you know, you need larger databases for accurate estimation of uh, genetic correlations. So one first thing that you start, the, everybody starts doing is comparing contrasting groups based on residual feed intake. This is some results that we have, and again, we compare the green values are the 20% uh, that are uh, the animals that are 20% high efficiency. See, these are the inefficient animals, and basically we compare not just only the what we see is there's no difference in growth and body weight. There's no difference in body composition of those lambs. We didn't see difference in uh, body composition estimated based on condition score. We didn't see difference in fleece weight or in fact like measurement of genetic resistance to uh, internal parasites. The same animals that were measured here as lambs, the females, went to the farms and we measured the, and compare different production traits of those animals on grazing conditions, the reproductive performance, and again, the same animals that were grazing in the same conditions based on classification that they have previously here in the, in the feed efficiency test, there were no difference in their performance. 
this is another group of uh, associations. We have the association of residual feeding types, and it's what you're going to see basically in most of the studies. First is residual feeding type and the association within the traits that are recorded at the time of the, that feed efficiency is measured. And then the most difficult one is the association of residual feed intakes with traits that are expressed in another moment of the life of the animals. One is what is very common, and you see in, uh, in beef cattle a lot, is because residual feed intake in cattle is measured or during growing or during fattening, is that it's easy then to collect the data of those animals at, uh, at slaughter. So you have an idea of carcass weight, conformation, and other traits, or in the case that is measured in, uh, in animals in dairy, you can measure immediately the uh, milk production. Not the lifetime milk production, but the first, the, the, the milk in the, in the first lactation. That is what's more common in the, in, in the history of the literature. So there's a, I was mentioning that, well, that one of the first concerns in terms of improving residual feed intake or improving feed efficiency is the negative impact on the fatness of the animal. Because sometimes in some works they found some negative correlations. This is uh, data that we had in beef cattle and, and it's an example of many other studies that didn't show that negative correlation. But with one, cons one uh, comment. In this case, we have the genetic correlation. Uh, this is with beef cattle, but, uh, and again, uh, residual feed intake have a strong correlation with dry matter intake. That is what, what we expected, and we didn't see significant correlations with a, a growth, weight, and this is ultrasound back fatness. Because in the case of, uh, of beef cattle, we include in the estimation of residual feed intake to estimate the receipt, to calculate the residual feed intake that goes into the genetic evaluation, because we have genetic evaluation in beef cattle for residual feed intake, we include the fatness. And we know already that there's no correlation. And again, comparing with other traits, when you compare uh, contrasting groups, we didn't see difference in terms of carcass weight, uh, the weight of the high price cuts, meat quality in measure uh, indicated as tenderness, intramuscular fat, or fatty acid profile. One important thing that is related, that has a lot to do with the correlation with other moments in, the, in terms of residual feed intake is has to do with the, with the feet and the time when you are measuring things. For example, here is the repetibility and, and there's uh, phenotypic correlations, <coughs> phenotypic and genetic correlations at the measurements of dry matter intake and residual feed intake in sheep. And what you see here, there's two different works. Uh, These are examples of uh, measuring the same animals in consecutive phases, sometimes with the same diet, sometimes with different diets. But basically what you see is that in terms of phenotypic correlations, that is the first one, the first two tables that you have there, um, the correlations are stronger in terms of dry matter intake, so there's a, a quite repetible, and the association is weaker between different stages or different ages of the animal for residual feed intake. As you can see here, 
for example, measuring post winning and the Hoggett correlation is high, is high, and when you try to compare or predict the correlation or the predict the the, the predictive value, the genetics from post winning to an adult animal, the correlations are weaker. The residual feed intakes, they are not different from zero. As you can see here, the common problem in these studies because of the, the difficulties to get the records, the phenotypic records is, and it's a common problem for all our studies, is the large uh, standard deviations of the estimations, particularly in genetic correlation. And that's one of the first main concerns in terms of everything that we need more time to get larger databases. Another thing, and it's, uh, uh, it's very relevant for research, but it's, uh, for the industry, it's the common question that we have been from the industry. It, what's happened, if I measure and I know the residual feeding tape, and even I know the breeding value for residual feeding tape for an animal, for a ram, what is going to happen with the progeny of the ram if that progeny is going to be raised in grazing conditions? That's the big question. And it's the big question for everybody, and we don't really have the best answer yet. So what we have here is, uh, well, the limitation for, uh, for those is the problems that we have to get, especially when you, you need uh, measurements of or estimation of feed intake for longer periods because m most of the protocols for measuring feed intake on pasture implies periods of six days of collecting samples. So you are sort of uh, uh, taking pictures and it's very difficult to keep recording data all the time because the, the protocol for doing measuring measurements of feed intake is, is very uh, time consuming. But this is interesting and I, that's why I put this example of this test. They, they use different diets. No? This one uh, that is uh, grass silage and ad libitum and concentrate on, uh, on confinement conditions and ha uh, high concentrate in confinement conditions and then they compare with grass that it was actually measuring feed intake, individual feed intake uh, using alkanes in grass. And this is just the correlations between the different rates that they use. Uh, one of the main conclusions is if you want to predict what could be the residual feed intake or even the feed intake of an animal in grazing conditions, it's important to include uh, fiber, that means uh, silage or grass silage or sorghum silage or just any version of pasture or similarity that includes fiber in the diet to have a strong repetibility of the behavior of the, those animals later on pasture. If what is more important is to predict the feed intake or the residual feed intake in feedlots or intensive finishing of lambs or cattle, then you have two options. One is to use actually the same diet in the, in the confinement res in the, during the, the residual feed intake test, or you have a good, relatively good correlations when you use, that would be this point, a silage and concentrate with the behavior in high concentrate that would be, high concentrate would be a, a diet on finishing animals uh, cattle or, or lambs is the same. This is still being one of the, the one, the first group of person that find an accurate way to record feed intake that would be uh, the solution for many of the problems and the uh, 
comparisons that we have. One is that the strategy that we are trying to follow here is to establish recording systems in a way that we can, although we can know the idea, for example, like in, in the, what I showed before. If I know that animals can be or phenotypically or genetically, because I can estimate, for example, the breeding values of those animals, and I know that their progeny, if I can take their progenies to grazing conditions and recording over there, at least I will know if they, if selecting for high efficiency would have a negative impact in any of the traits that are relevant. I mentioned here production, but it's also all the resilient traits that have been included. And this is just a table to practice you some Spanish. That means production, uh, land meat, prolificity, uh, uh, quality of carcass and meat, wool, resilience, both uh, lambs and use, because we're going to see a, a, an example of effect of, of uh, infection with an internal parasite in sheep today in the afternoon, and efficiency. And efficiency means uh, feed conversion efficiency uh, or residual feed intake. That is actually what we are measuring, but it's also uh, methane emissions. In summary, feed intake and feed efficiency are both economically and environmentally relevant. We included in the life cycle analysis the impact of uh, using genetics for uh, higher feed efficiency and has a huge impact on the uh, carbon footprint of the uh, sheep production systems. The readability is not the restriction. There's potential for genetic improvement by selection. The problem is everything else around. It's important and, and there's genetic variation for, for selection. The problem is how to get the phenotype and how to implement from a global perspective the, uh, the animal breeding system. Feed intake is difficult to measure phenotype. We have equipments nowadays and technology to do the measurements in confinements. Because of the relevance of the, of the be consistent and, and uniform in terms of the feeding test, uh, feed efficiency test, there are different levels of international collaborations to develop protocols that is going to be the base by if in any future we're going to be able to put together data from different countries. This is a must. Then you have the limitations that I mentioned for recording uh, feed intake in grazing conditions. And uh, so far, we're going to have to live with that. And I'm and it's going to be great to be able to, to, to remove that limitation. Yeah, identifying the trade-off between feed efficiency and other relevant traits is, is important, and again, Accurate estimation of genetic correlations relies on large number of animals. And again, I'm going back to international collaborations that requires systematic and uniform protocols to do the measurements. And there's a point that I didn't mention that this is feed efficiency and feed intake is related with greenhouse gas emissions. And it's another area that we need to to take into account. Many of the countries involved in feed efficiency and measurements are doing also methane emissions. The fact of having trade-off is, n well, we don't want to have trade-off. But if there are trade-off between traits, we can manage from a breeding point of view in terms of selection indices. Is the way to manage these antagonisms. The point is that we need to identify and to quantify. Identify is maybe easier than to have accurate estimations of the associations. In terms of animal breeding, genomic selection is an alternative for, uh, for improving feed efficiency. 
But again, high accuracies of genomic breeding values relies on large reference populations. And again, I go back to international reference populations that requires the way to get large number of animals and is the way to international coverage. It's good that the, the ICAR is working now on developing this protocol together and putting the information and the experience and the expertise of the different countries that are working on this in terms of uh, having the first steps for, uh, for this. I want to thank Ignacio and Gabriel from Uruguay in this presentation, and also Donna Berry and Nicola Lam, who borrowed some uh, PowerPoints and helped me with some of the images, too. So thank you very much. <laughs>